Okay, we are back. Um, we're ready now to start the second session of our day today. And uh, first up will be uh, Matt Lebowitz speaking about beliefs about genetic causation on positively and negatively valenced phenotypes. Okay. Uh, let me just share my slides here. Okay. Um, so, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Lebowitz, as you've heard. Um, I'm an assistant professor in the psychiatry department here at Columbia, and I'm very pleased to be presenting in the second session this afternoon. Um, in my talk, I'll be speaking about some research looking at genetic causal attributions for positively and negatively balanced phenotypes. Um, and this is work that I did with my colleagues, Katie Tabb and Paul Applebaum. Uh, Katie is now at Bard College. Paul, of course, is here at Columbia. Um, and I'll get into a little bit about what I mean by positively and negatively balanced phenotypes as I go forward. So the backdrop to this work is the increasing attention that's being paid to the role of genes in causing various behaviors and traits as our knowledge of behavior genetics becomes increasingly sophisticated, and also the growing literature in psychology examining the implications of genetic causal attributions, the sort of downstream effects um, and correlates of genetic explanations. And one thing we had noticed in the literature is that there seemed to be a discrepancy in how genetic explanations affect social perceptions like blame, where providing a genetic explanation for stigmatized health conditions like mental disorders or obesity uh, seemed to reduce the extent to which people are blamed for having these conditions. So the idea being that um, if you have a condition that's caused by your genes, then it's not your fault, you're not responsible, you're not to blame. Um, but at the same time, giving a genetic explanation for wrongdoing um, did not seem to consistently decrease blame and punishment. And we wondered, why might this be? Why is it that genetic explanations seem to consistently reduce blame in some cases, but not so much in others? And we reasoned that perhaps certain behaviors or traits evoke a resistance to genetic explanations. Um, and, and we wondered, you know, are people motivated to discount genetic explanations in the case of bad behavior, of which um, there are many different examples, such as criminality? Um, is it the case that people don't like the idea that bad behavior, harmful behavior, is caused could be caused by a person's genes? Um, and if that's the case, this could help to explain the sometimes no effects of genetic explanations for bad behavior that we see in the literature. Now, there was already some evidence that people's receptivity to biological explanations is influenced by factors beyond just the quality of the explanations themselves. So we know, for example, that political and social attitudes can motivate people to accept or reject biological explanations. So for example, um, belief in biological explanations for sexual orientation um, and racial disparities and various outcomes often seem to break down along political and social attitude type lines. Um, research had also shown that actions uh, with negative consequences are seen as involving more intentionality and control. Uh, Kate Lynch alluded, alluded to this literature a bit in uh, the latter part of her talk, um, I believe. We've also seen that people are more inclined to attribute negative as opposed to positive events to other people's agency and intentionality. Uh, and that learning about or experiencing immoral, the immoral behavior of others even seems to increase the belief in free will. So there seems to be this connection between um, negatively balanced uh, bad outcomes or harmful behaviors, negative events, uh, immoral behavior seems to be connected with this idea of free will, intentionality, control, agency, uh, which one might think would cut against genetic explanations potentially if people see genetic explanations as inherently uh, non-agentive or um, not being compatible with free will type explanations. So in thinking about the possibility that people might be especially unreceptive to genetic explanations for wrongdoing, we considered the fact that people seem to have this proclivity to favor blame versus non-blame explanations for harmful events. This is um, 
been referred to as the Boolean validation account. Um, this motivation to blame others for their wrongdoing may reflect a desire to remain free to punish or maintain the validity of blaming and punishing people by um, resisting the application of causal frameworks that seem to deflect blame or culpability. So we, we wondered if this might lead people to discount genetic explanations for bad or harmful um, antisocial behavior to the extent that they view genetic, genetic explanations as non-blame explanations, as exculpatory explanations. Another reason why people could potentially resist genetic causal attributions for harmful behavior is this widespread assumption that uh, has been uh, explored in the psychology literature somewhat extensively in the last 10 years or so that um, inside every individual, there is a true self that is morally virtuous. Um, so people seem to believe that we all have this morally virtuous true self deep inside of us. Um, and there's also, you know, according to the genetic essentialism literature, this idea that genes represent the essence of a person or maybe phrased another way, their true self. So perhaps um, the idea of genes causing wrongdoing or contributing to influencing uh, wrongdoing, negatively balanced behavior might conflict with the idea of this virtuous essence or true self. So both the blame validation and true self accounts could lead potentially to a rejection of genetic explanations for bad or harmful behavior which led us to our hypothesis that people would less readily ascribe antisocial as opposed to pro-social behavior to genetic causes. So in the first study we did looking at this question, we randomly assigned participants to either a pro-social or an antisocial condition, and they viewed two vignettes, little scenarios or stories in a counterbalanced order. One described a woman named Jane encountering an unconscious homeless man on the street. The other described a student named Tom encountering a bullying incident at his school. Uh, and according to, or depending on the experimental condition to which the participant had been randomly assigned, they either read cases where Tom and Jane both responded in their scenario with pro-social behavior or both with antisocial behavior. And these are just the stimuli you can see here. Um, so in the antisocial versions, Jane steals the unconscious homeless man's cup of money and Tom joins in with the bullies and in the pro-social versions, uh, Jane checks on the man to make sure he's okay, and Tom comes to the defense of the bullying victim. Um, after reading each vignette, participants were asked to rate how much of a role they believed genetics played in causing the behavior they had read about. Um, and what we found was that the antisocial behavior evoked significantly weaker genetic attributions than the pro-social behavior did. We then replicated this finding, finding the same pattern of stronger genetic attributions for pro-social than antisocial behavior, uh, regardless of whether uh, genetic attributions were explicitly provided or explicitly disclaimed um, in two follow-up studies, um, studies two and three of this paper. And so then we turned our attention to this question of um, why is it that people think bad behavior is less genetic than good behavior? And we consider two possible mechanisms, which I alluded to earlier. First is the blame validation hypothesis. So this idea that maybe people think genetic explanations deflect uh, personal or moral responsibility. So they're motivated to discount them in the case of misbehavior to kind of preserve their, their freedom to blame and punish wrongdoers. Um, the other being the true self hypothesis. So maybe people think everyone's true self or essence is inherently good. And if genes represent a person's essence, then people might resist the notion of genes causing bad behavior, causing antisocial behavior. So in study four of this uh, set of experiments, we had participants read about a woman named Jane behaving pro-socially or antisocially in one of six scenarios. And in addition to the genetic attribution rating, they also provided two ratings aimed at gauging these potential mediators or psychological mechanisms of the asymmetry in genetic attributions. First being, to what extent do you believe Jane is responsible for her patterns of behavior you just read about uh, to get at this responsibility or blame validation account? 
And second, to what extent do you think Jane's pattern of behavior that you just read about reflect who she truly is to try to get at the true self, uh, the true self account? These are the six scenarios. Um, just in the interest of time, I won't spend a lot of time dwelling on this, but um, this gives you a sense of what they looked like. And what we found was that genetic attributions were weaker for antisocial as opposed to prosocial behavior across the scenarios repl replicating the first three studies. And responsibility ratings were also stronger for antisocial behavior than prosocial behavior, whereas true self ratings didn't differ significantly between the two types of behavior. Um, and there was a significant indirect effect through descriptions of responsibility, um, but no significant indirect effect through true self rating. So it seemed like um, the, the responsibility, the asymmetry and responsibility descriptions between prosocial and antisocial behavior was a significant mediator of the asymmetry and genetic attributions, but there was no difference in true self ratings that would similarly account for the effect. And this is just a diagram of that mediation analysis. You can see there is some evidence here that um, responsibility ratings were a mediator. Um, but if you look at the indirect effect, it's not super robust. The point estimate was only 0.06. And if you look at the confidence interval, uh, the lower bound is 0.01. So this uh, blame validation account, at least as a represented by the, by the responsibility rating, may not be the whole story. And I will return to that idea um, a bit later. Um, we also did two more studies. Um, we first found the same pattern of results with stronger uh, genetic attributions for pro-social versus antisocial behavior when the behaviors being described were general tendencies rather than a specific instance. And the same pattern of results again when the antisocial behaviors in question were serious violent crimes as opposed to the more petty types of antisocial behavior that had been described in, early, in the stimuli in earlier experiments. So just to summarize what we found so far, uh, it seems clear that people seem more willing to attribute pro-social as opposed to antisocial behavior to genetic causes. And this may be due to a motivation to see antisocial behavior as a product of free will rather than genetics in order to preserve the kind of ability to blame or punish wrongdoers. Although that may not be the same story, the whole story as I uh, alluded to. Um, and I, I think, there are possible implications for research methods. So researchers who are looking at the effects of genetic explanations may want to, at the very least, use things like manipulation checks, as it seems like people may be resistant to even believing in genetic causation for certain behaviors or outcomes. So uh, experimental manipulations of genetic attributions may be more or less successful, depending on the uh, behavior that is purportedly being explained. Um, similarly, there may be broader implications for uh, science literacy in terms of how people react to behavior genetics findings, for example. So um, it may be that people's willingness to accept certain scientific findings as real could depend on the moral valence or evalu uh, evaluation of the behavior whose genetic basis is supposedly being revealed. And I think that's, that's worth keeping in mind. Okay, so after we published the results that I presented so far, we turned our attention to a series of follow-up questions that we wanted to answer to try to learn more about the phenomenon we had demonstrated. And one of those was about what psychological processes might be behind these asymmetries, because as I mentioned, we have a bit of evidence that asymmetries and descriptions of responsibility um, could be playing a role, but that mediation effect was not very robust. So uh, we wondered what other mediators may be at play. And one possibility that we thought about was differences in perceptions of naturalness. So it's been argued that genetic explanations uh, result in traits and characteristics being perceived as more natural. Um, and that in some cases, this can even lead people to view such characteristics more positively because of a tendency people have to associate naturalness with goodness. So for example, there's some evidence that genetic explanations for sexual orientation can be associated with less negative attitudes and beliefs about homosexuality. And it's been suggested that this may be due to genetic explanations causing homosexuality to be perceived as more natural. Um, and Kate's actually written about this a bit. Um, indeed, you know, the presumption of naturalness has been identified as a key bias that gets activated by genetic explanations. Um, so that's sort of, a directional effect potentially. And one thing we considered is whether this um, 
effect could actually operate in the opposite direction or be bidirectional. So could it be that this natural good link that people seem to have in their mind could operate in the opposite direction where um, people might perceive good or pro-social behavior to be more natural than antisocial behavior or, or harmful behavior? And could this explain to some extent why there's greater endorsement of genetic causality for pro-social as compared to antisocial behaviors. So to try to answer this question, we investigated naturalness as a potential mediator of the asymmetry and genetic attributions between pro-social and antisocial behavior. So we gave people a scenario where Jane was described as either kind, generous, and caring, or mean, selfish, and uncaring. And we asked them, how natural do you think this behavior is, as well as how genetically influenced it is? Um, and we found that genetic attribution ratings were again significantly higher when Jane was engaging in pro-social behavior than antisocial behavior. And when we looked at naturalness, we saw that pro-social behavior was rated as more natural than antisocial behavior. Um, naturalness was associated with genetic attributions. And the asymmetry in naturalness was a significant mediator of the asymmetry in genetic attributions. And this indirect effect was much stronger than what we had saw earlier for responsibility. So it seems like naturalness may be playing quite a robust role here as a mediator. We also considered another follow-up question, which was what would people say about the role of genes in their own pro-social and antisocial behavior? So um, in this study, we prompted people to take a moment to think of one example of your own behavior from the past year that you were most ashamed or proud of. For example, we told them um, in the antisocial condition that they could think about the most selfish or harmful thing that they can remember doing, um, or in the pro-social condition, the most generous or helpful thing they, they can remember doing. And then we had them consider this behavior and complete readings of how natural it was, how much it reflected their true self, how responsible they were for the action or behavior, and how genetically influenced they thought the behavior was, um, how much it had to do with their genes. What we found was that the naturalness, true self, and genetic attribution ratings were all higher for the pro-social condition than the antisocial condition, but there was no difference in responsibility ratings. So I'm sorry that it was a little hard to fit this figure on a slide, but what we found is that unlike in our prior mediation work, asymmetries, the asymmetries in both naturalness and true self ratings were significant mediators of the asymmetry in genetic attributions, but descriptions of responsibility were not a significant mediator. So it seems notable that unlike when we previously looked at true self ratings as a potential mediator and it wasn't significant, um, in the case of considering one's own behavior, it was significant. So maybe a, a motivation to view the true self as good operates more strongly when people are thinking about the reasons for their own behavior than when they're thinking about another person's behavior. Um, but importantly, it seems that naturalness is, again, a pretty robust mediator of the asymmetries in genetic attributions across these different scenarios. We saw that emerge here as well. And that led us to our next question, which was, does the asymmetry extend beyond pro-social and antisocial behavior? And the reason I think that's relevant to naturalness as a potential mediator is that unlike blame validation, naturalness could be mediating these differences beyond uh, situations that are relevant to helpful and harmful considerations. So um, if there's a behavior that may be positively or negatively balanced, but not necessarily helpful or harmful, uh, blame validation would be less likely to play a role, or blame in general wouldn't be particularly relevant, but nationalness still could be. So we asked whether other positively and negatively balanced uh, traits or behaviors besides pro-social and antisocial behavior might also show asymmetrical genetic attributions, and if so, would this be mediated by asymmetrical perceptions of nationalness? So, for example, we told some of the participants all her life, Jane has been very organized. Um, people consider her to be the most, one of the most organized people they've ever met. Or we had a condition where alternatively people were told that Jane was very disorganized. And what we found was that when we asked about genetic attributions, people thought that being organized was significantly more genetically influenced than being disorganized. We found the same pattern when we asked, asked about or prompted people with attractiveness. Uh, people rated uh, Jane's attractiveness is significantly more genetically determined or influenced than her unattractiveness. 
And combining across the organization and attractiveness kind of phenotypes, um, we saw again the positively valence characteristics of being organized and being attractive were rated as more natural. Um, naturalness was associated with genetic attributions and this asymmetry and naturalness was again a significant mediator of the asymmetry that we observed in the genetic attribution ratings. And we've also asked whether the same asymmetry would extend to health outcomes. So in other words, if people see appealing traits like being organized or attractive uh, um, as more genetically caused or influenced than unappealing traits like being disorganized or unattractive, would that same kind of asymmetry emerge for good versus health, good versus bad health outcomes? So will people see good health as more genetically influenced than ill health? And if so, would this be accounted for by a perception that good health is more natural than bad health? So in this set of studies, we prompted people with a, a description of a woman again named Jane, I haven't been very creative here. Um, we described her as an adult woman living in the United States and the methods varied slightly from study to study, but basically what we told participants was that according to her doctor, Jane meets medical standards for one of these, uh, it ended up being seven different conditions um, across the different experiments. So depression, obesity, hypertension, osteoporosis, alcohol use disorder, nicotine use disorder, and gambling disorder. Uh, so half of the participants were randomly assigned to each experiment to be told that uh, Jane had this disorder or met criteria, the diagnostic criteria or medical standards for the disorder. And the other half were told that she didn't have the disorder. She instead had the corresponding um, normal or healthy uh, trait. So a normal mood, a normal weight, normal blood pressure, normal bone density, normal alcohol use, or uh, in the latter two conditions, the last, the last two experiments, not smoking cigarettes and not gambling. And we asked the participants to rate how natural uh, uh, it was for Jane to have this um, and also how genetically caused this outcome was. And okay, here are the results. And again, apologies that this figure was a bit hard to fit on a slide, which makes it a little hard to read, but um, the, the general gist is that, so the blue bars are the, the good health outcomes when the diagnosis was absent, and the orange bars are the bad health outcomes when the diagnosis was present. Um, and the, the basic idea is that the blue bars are almost always higher than the orange bars. So in other words, the good health outcomes were always in every case rated as more natural than the bad health outcomes. And in most cases, uh, having the diagnosis um, was also rated as uh, less genetically caused than, uh, and the good health outcome was rated as more genetically influenced um, than the bad health outcome. And the exception to that was the three addictive disorders, so alcohol use disorder, nicotine use disorder, and gambling disorder. In those cases, having the diagnosis was rated as more genetically influenced, even though not having it was still seen as more natural. So there was a little bit of a dissociation there. We're not sure exactly why that is. Uh, we thought maybe it was because in these cases, the absence of disorder just means basically not engaging in a certain behavior. And maybe people had a hard time saying that not engaging in a behavior was genetically caused. Um, but uh, if anyone has any ideas about that, we'd love to hear, the, uh, hear about them in the, in the discussion. Um, another follow-up question we considered was whether other causal explanations besides genetic attributions would be endorsed more strongly for pro-social than for antisocial behavior. Um, and so we did a few studies looking at this. Um, so in one, we asked participants, um, we, we told participants that Jane in her childhood was surrounded by people who acted uh, in an antisocial or pro-social way, and now she's acting in that way. Um, people thought the her childhood experiences or observing people behaving a certain way in her childhood was more influential for the pro-social condition, pro-social behavior than antisocial condition uh, or antisocial behavior. Um, we found the same pattern of results when we it wasn't her childhood, but it was just people around her recently as an adult who were either behaving antisocially or pro-socially. Um, and now she's behaving the same way and people thought the behavior of others around her was more influential for pro-social behavior than antisocial behavior. Um, and also when we had an explicit peer pressure scenario where people were uh, explicitly telling her or trying to influence her to behave in a pro-social or antisocial way and, uh, or, or they weren't, um, people still thought that, that 
the behavior is more influential in the pro-social case than in the antisocial case. Okay, so um, to summarize and conclude, um, we've seen that people seem to consistently judge antisocial behavior to be less genetically and in some cases less environmentally influenced than pro-social beha uh, um, pro behavior. Um, a caveat to that is that we looked at only a very limited set of environmental influences. So we haven't really seen the full range of the contours of where this asymmetry would and wouldn't apply to um, environmental influences on behavior or traits. But we've seen some evidence that it's not specific to genetic explanations. Um, some of the, our earlier work has suggested that a desire to justify blame or validate blame, that is a motivation to maintain sort of the validity of the idea of blaming someone for their wrongdoing might play a role in why people might reject genetic explanations for antisocial or harmful behavior, but that doesn't seem to be the whole story. Similar asymmetry seems to happen for other traits where blame isn't less, is less relevant, like weaker, having weaker genetic attributions for unattractiveness as opposed to attractiveness or for even things like osteoporosis versus normal bone density. Uh, and so it seems like a more robust mediator seems to be the perception that good or, or positively balanced phenotypes are more natural than bad or negatively perceived phenotypes and thus uh, seen as more likely to be driven by genes because genes have this connection to naturalness. Uh, and in some cases, uh, for example, the asymmetrical genetic attributions for one's own pro-social or antisocial behavior, um, it seems to be that the perception that good behavior reflects the true self may also play a role. So if the true self is seen as akin to one's DNA, maybe that helps to explain why um, people like favor the idea of genes and DNA causing good behavior because they see their bias towards seeing the true self as virtuous. Um, this, I think, requires further research, but uh, we have some interesting, the, the, we had at least some interesting initial results. Okay, uh, I am going to end there. Um, so I just want to thank Katie and Paul, my collaborators on this, also the Templeton Foundation, which was the primary funder of this work through the Genetics and Human Agency Initiative. Um, I've also gotten some support from the National Human Genome Research Institute. And um, thank you to all of you for uh, being here today. Thank you so much, Matt. That was so interesting. I just, I want to clarify whether, whether I got it right or not. Did you, in fact, I mean, I think most people think of, uh, or most people, it is common to think of either genes or environment as causes. To, but it seems to me that you found that negative, that positively valence things were both more likely to be attributed to non-genetic causes and more likely to be attributed to genetic causes. Well, it's more that we found both uh, that uh, both genetic and environmental explanations were more strongly endorsed for positive behavior than for yeah. negative behavior. Uh -huh. uh, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's an interesting point, and this this came up. Um, we we talked about this in the paper as well. Um, there there is this often perception that um, genetic attributions are sort of in opposition to environmental attributions, or that if people are endorsing genetic attributions, they must be rejecting environmental attributions, or more commonly, if they're rejecting genetic attributions, they must be endorsing environmental attributions. Uh, that doesn't really turn out to be the case, actually. Um, people do seem to understand that, um, well, I don't know, this goes back to the question of what a good explanation is, but people do yeah. seem to be willing to endorse both genetic and environmental attributions and, and not view them necessarily as being opposition. Um, and we don't tend to measure them as being an attribution. So I don't like to use, for example, response scales that have very genetic on one end and very environmental on the yeah. other. I don't uh -huh. think that yeah. uh, represents how people think about these things necessarily. There is some evidence that people see uh, you know, choice as being in opposition to genetic cause, cause, causation, but not so much that they see environmental causation as being in opposition to genetic causation. But it's but almost as if they they are more likely to seek or find or believe in a cause, period, 
for a positively valence thing than for a negatively valence thing. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because there is there is also some other work that suggests that the opposite may be true in some cases. So there has been other work looking at, and I have to refresh my memory on the subject, but there have been papers and, and findings arguing that people uh, are more interested in doing like a deep dive and coming up with causal explanations for, for bad outcomes yeah. and really investigating why those come about and why people do bad things and less and, yeah. and just take for granted people doing good things. Um, so it's very interesting. Um, it is very interesting because I would have thought that if you thought something was natural, if you thought a positively valence thing was natural, you may seek an explanation for why that nature is not being manifested. You know, it seems right. <laughs> right. Uh, I'm seeing a question in the chat um, yeah. about who our subjects were, were they Columbia students? So, you know, they weren't Columbia students, but they uh, were, they were US adults, mostly recruited online um, through uh, platforms like Prolific, which like Tanya mentioned, um, using similar recruitment methodology. So there's pros and cons to that approach, but uh, this is certainly not a representative uh, population. Uh, and we, we have some other questions in the chat asking about cultural diversity. Yeah, so uh, in a similar vein to what I just said about the sampling methodologies we used, um, there, uh, the, the studies that I presented today um, were not represent, didn't use representative samples. Um, the samples are more diverse than some other recruitment methodologies yield, but they are, uh, they're, they're, we can't, we haven't made any cross-cultural kinds of comparisons. Uh, we do have some work looking at this, these questions in a nationally representative sample that we're still working on the analyses and writing for. Uh, and in that work, we also looked at, um, tried to look at the influences of some demographic characteristics. So does it matter if the person's a man or a woman or a black or white? How does that impact mm -hmm. the uh, genetic attributions? Um, I don't have the answers at my fingertips to give you right now, but um, we should have that analyzed it hopefully sometime in the near future. Tanya? Um, thank you for the talk, Su super interesting work. I have a question related to the conversation that you just had with Ruth immediately afterwards. Um, I've been trying to reconcile your data with, with a result I'll tell you about in a moment, and I can't figure out how all the pieces fit together. And so I'm wondering if, if you can. So a few years ago, I did um, a series of studies um, with Sarah Gottlieb, where we looked at what people thought science could and should explain. So the way that we asked them was like, you know, to what extent they agree that one day science can provide a complete explanation for blank and the blanks were psychological phenomena, like for pro-social behavior, for belief in God, for headaches, for depth perception, all sorts of things, and whether or not it made them uncomfortable to think that science could fully explain something. And one of the predictors, not the biggest one, but one of the predictors was something like valence. But it went in the direction where people thought that science was more likely to be able to fully explain um, the, the abnormal or bad things. So science could explain forgetting more than it could explain remembering. It could explain antisocial behavior more than it could explain pro-social behavior and so on. And so you know, clearly the question we were asking was different here. And so I've been trying to, but I've been trying to wrap my mind around, you know, what's what's different about your cases? Um, do you think, or, or what's different about, you know, different way to frame the crisis? What's different about asking for about a scientific explanation in general versus the genetic explanation in particular mm -hmm. that would perhaps explain this difference? Do you have any thoughts? And I, I can put the reference in chat too, if other people are interested. Yeah, I would love to see that. I mean, I, I you know, in the 30 seconds that I've had to think about it, what I've come up with, um, you know, maybe totally off base but i one thing that comes to mind is that you know we were asking about sort of the facts of the world so does do genetics actually cause this versus uh can geneticists figure out the causes of this um and it sounds to me like if you're asking people to this is wild speculation but it seems to me like if you're asking people um will science be able to explain this? Um, you may in some way almost be like triggering the, uh, the idea that, you know, um, scientists would be 
it's easier to pick out like an abnormal thing to come up with a scientific explanation for maybe in some way like or scientists would only even be investigating it in the first place if it was um, pathological or abnormal or unnatural and so um, it maybe doesn't require an explanation if it's just the normal course of events or natural cause of events but um, I'd have to think about it more but that's sort of a general idea that Popped into my head as you were talking about that, but it's a very interesting kind of juxtaposition with our findings, definitely. Okay. Thanks, Matt. That was fascinating. And some of it, yeah, very counterintuitive as well, which is interesting. Um, I was wondering if anyone's done any work on um, examples with non humans. So to kind of push on the moral responsibility mediator, if you had um, vignettes which involved, you know, a dog that has a that's very obedient versus not very obedient some sort of valence trait in that in that way or even organisms that we wouldn't attribute agency to at all like plants if you give if you ask people about genetic and environmental explanations in those situations would you expect the same kind of results or do you think the moral responsibility part would drop off you know it's, it's an interesting question because i think the um it, it really i wish i had thought of that when we were when we still have the Templin grant, because it's it's a really interesting kind of thought experiment. Like if you wanted to look at, if you wanted to tease about these mediators, I could definitely imagine that the moral responsibility or the blame validation account um, and the true self account even would probably completely fall away in those cases because people probably don't perceive non-humans to have a true self or to have moral responsibility or or to, for blame to be relevant, but I could imagine that naturalness would still be very relevant. Um, you know, people ascribe naturalness definitely to plants, you know, in uh, genetically modified plants versus non-modified plants or foods have naturalness. People have naturalist perceptions about foods and, and other inanimate objects too. So um, to the extent that naturalness is playing the biggest role, which is what we seem to find, I could imagine that there would could be something um you could see the same imagery to some extent for that reason but it's a very interesting question thanks um one thought was that perhaps changing the name of the of the person from jane to something else like carmen or shania or shania my yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, that, that's a that's a good point. Names, changing names of people in vignettes has been used as a way of manipulating things like um, perception of the person's race or ethnicity um, in other experiments, and it's a valid method for doing that. Um, so, in our in our work, looking at where we did experimentally manipulate the uh, the demographic characteristics of the person in the vignette. Uh, I don't think we change the name. Uh, it may not. We may not have used Jane. I have to look back at the stimuli, but um, but we explicitly provided demographic information about the person to see uh, what effect that might have. I think for the most part, it didn't have much of a of an impact. But there may have been some um, some interaction effects that um, I don't have the full analysis done. So, um, but we will know more about that question hopefully once we do. Matt, I'm curious how you measured genetic attribution. You know, I've, as you know well, I've agonized over that measure in my studies. Yeah, um, maybe we should have agonized it over it more. Um, <laughs> but we just asked people, you know, do you um, basically how much of a role do you think her genes, um, her genetics play in causing this behavior? Yeah. And they just rated it from one, which is labeled not at all, uh, not no role or a very minor role. Yeah. Seven, which is a very major role, I, I believe. Yeah. Um, and I've used variations of that measure in a lot of work. Um, yeah, that's one of the questions better. we've asked as well, along with several others. Yeah. Yeah. Are there other comments? I'm looking in the chat here. 
Thank you for the paper, Tanya. Okay. Well, hearing nothing, I think we can we can move on. Thank you very much, Matt, again. Um, our last talk today will be by Eric Perrins, and he's going to talk about what have we learned about the psychosocial impacts of receiving genomic information? Eric, thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Perfect. So, um, the, the conference was originally framed as about genetic causation and about uh, the impacts of receiving genomic information. And I was assigned to talk about um, these psychosocial impacts. And I, as you'll see, um, gone a little beyond that. Um, so in addition to addressing uh, the question in my advertised title, um, what have we learned about the psychosocial impacts of receiving genomic information, I also want to address a second question, which is, um, what does what we've learned about the psychosocial impacts mean for informed consent? That is, I'm interested in the question, what are the impacts? And I'm also interested in the question, so what? Like, who cares what the impacts are? Um, at the, the risk of uh, ruining the suspense, let me tell you my plan and um, my answers to those or gesture anyway to the answers to those two questions. Um, I want to remind you why we have traditionally cared about informed consent. I do want to um, describe what we've learned about negative psychosocial impacts of sharing genomic inf information and you know, to let the cat out of the bag. You know, on average, the psychosocial impacts are mild and transient. Um, then I want to suggest um, that those smaller than expected negative impacts, plus three other factors, which I'm going to walk through, growing enthusiasm, enthusiasm about the value of sequencing, growing despair about the efficacy of informed consent, growing consensus around the critique of the right not to know. I'm going to say that all of those kind of add up to a, this temptation to let informed consent go. Then I'm going to try to articulate three points to suggest that succumbing to that temptation would be a mistake. And then I'm going to wrap it up. Um, so why we've traditionally uh, cared about informed consent. Um, according to the Belmont report, the process of informed consent is meant to be an application of the principle of respect for persons. So in, in the context of clinical genetics, the first way we show persons res respect is by asking them if they want to access genetic information. And in the act of showing persons respect, we are recognizing the fundamental fact of individual differences. That is, in light of their understanding of their own psychologies and their conception of good life, different reasonable people can have different preferences regarding the same piece of genetic information. Now, even in 1979, um, when the Belmont Report was issued, it was obvious that the conception and execution of informed consent were highly imperfect. As the authors of the Belmont Report wrote, while the importance of informed consent is unquestioned, controversy prevails over the nature and possibility of informed consent. Today, with the rise of whole genome sequencing, we might write, enough controversy prevails over the nature and possibility of informed consent that the importance of informed consent is being questioned. And what I want to do is I want to recognize why that questioning is going on, and I want to push back against it a little. So what we've learned about the psychosocial impacts, I think this um, 2019 um, special report 
that our seer put together is a nice exploration of the territory. Um, as many of you know, at the launch of the Human Genome Project, many LC scholars speculated that sharing genetic information with patients might have large, enduring, negative psychosocial impacts, including depressed mood, anxiety, stress, guilt, blame, and stigma. And by the way, notice that I, I am focusing on negative impacts because in decades past, it was the anticipation of those that made the importance uh, of informed consent, as I said earlier, unquestioned. And by the way, the, the picture regarding positive impacts is similar, but, but that's not what I'm going to be talking about today. So as many of you know, those original predictions turned out to be wildly simplistic, to go back to Tanya's original point. Um, this 2019 special supplement uh, that I just mentioned still offers a very nice introduction to a more nuanced picture of the extent of the negative psychosocial impacts. The reassuring part of the picture in that special issue is that, on average, among the people who underwent an informed consent process to enter the studies on psychosocial impacts, the negative psychosocial impacts were far less than predicted by that first crop of LC scholars. Scott Roberts, um, who was central in leading the reveal study on Alzheimer's that many of you are familiar with, concludes the psychological distress in response to genetic susceptibility testing is generally mild and transient for those who choose to undergo testing. And in his contribution to the special supplement, Christopher Wade writes, the studies typically found that negative psychosocial impacts of genetic testing were absent or modest, and if adverse of impacts were observed, participants returned to baseline within a few months. So how, how, how could the first crop of LC researchers have been so wrong? Um, well, you know, part of the explanation seems to be, or at least according to Roberts and Wade, um, part of the answer is to be found in the affective forecasting literature, according to which um, we're just lousy at forecasting or predicting our emotional reactions to future events. Forgive me for telling this to the social psychologists. Um, that is, we tend to overestimate the intensity and duration of our emotional reactions to future events, especially uh, to negative ones. So we fail to appreciate that on average, we are more adaptable and resilient than we think we are. And in, in part four, I'm gonna come back to who we are that are, are more resilient and uh, are, are so resilient and adaptable. But for now, insofar as informed consent is meant as an opportunity for patients to refuse to receive information that might negatively impact them, and insofar as the average impacts that these studies find are mild and transient, one might now indeed be moved to loosen one's hold on informed consent. After all, giving people a chance to protect themselves from imaginary harms doesn't seem like a, an excellent use of scarce uh, resources. So, let me turn to these three additional factors that I think can lead to a temptation to, to let informed consent go. Um, at the same time as our knowledge of the smaller than expected negative impacts was growing, so was enthusiasm for genome sequencing. Um, enthusiasm for sequencing all newborns is, is real. In a recent piece on newborn sequencing in Nature Biotechnology, Carolyn Seidel wrote, as you can read here, just as the pediatrician does blood tests and checks for developmental markers at each visit, the genome could also be checked for variants that might be relevant at that stage. Enthusiasm for sequencing in the prenatal context, where to a disturbing extent, routinization has set in and fully informed consent has already gone by the wayside, there is also, at least in some quarters, enthusiasm for sequencing all fetuses. Um, Joe Lee Simpson wrote in 2015, I personally look forward to everyone having their genome sequenced. Conditions now diagnosed during newborn screening could be detected in utero. 
why wait? And enthusiasm for all adults is real, as in this 2018 press release from Geisinger. Mammograms, colonoscopies, and cholesterol checks are just a few of the routine screening saving lives by detecting cancers and heart disease early. Geisinger patients will soon add DNA sequencing to that list of routine screenings. And by the way, I'm all for genetic screening that saves lives, including and the cancer and heart disease um, screening is an excellent example of a test that is enormously important. I'm describing enthusiasm at this point. Again, remember trying to remember, trying to explain why it is that there is this move towards letting informed consent go. So at the same time as knowledge of smaller than expected negative impa impacts was growing and enthusiasm about sequencing was growing, so was awareness of another substantive reason to be tempted to let informed consent go, or at least to let an absolutistic commitment to informed consent go. This reason um, is to be found in the critique of the right not to know that Ben Berkman uh, so powerfully articulated in 2017. Um, as the critique points out, insofar as informed consent presumes that a patient has a right not to know genomic information, patients have a right to refuse to receive information that could save their or their child's life. And as Berkman observed, this entails requiring physicians to in fulfilling their obligation to respect autonomy, violate their obligation to benefit their patients. The American College of Medical Genetics was also deeply skeptical about any absolute right not to know when in 2013, it asserted that if any one of a list of 56 medically actionable genes was found secondary to the primary target, those results should be returned automatically without any additional informed consent process um, beyond the one that was given for the primary finding. Th there was significant pushback in 2015, as many of you know, and ACMG revised its, its advice to say that patients could opt out of receiving results concerning those actionable findings. But there, but there was, in my view, justified skepticism at ACMG about um, a right not to know in the context of these potentially life-saving findings. And in the newborn screening program in the US, uh, that they never went in for an absolute commitment to the right not to know. That is, they were, I guess, uh, always uh, sympathetic to Ben's critique, um, insofar as they made it de facto mandatory to receive at least non-genetic information about treatable or preventable, um, mainly metabolic disorders. So the uh, recommended uniform uh, screening panel of the RUSP you know, lists these 35 core conditions, which the committee recommends every baby should be screened for without informed consent. So my point here is simply that the existence of the RUSP 35 and what is now the ACMG 78, I believe, they both give me reason to take very seriously Berkman's critique of an absolutistic commitment to the right not to know and recognizing the potential harm that can be entailed by an absolutistic commitment to the right not to know is a reason, a plausible reason for loosening a too tight hold on informed consent. I'm granting the reasonableness of this and I don't, and I wanna resist what I take to be an overcorrection. That's where I'm going. So at the same time, as knowledge of the smaller than expected negative impacts was growing and enthusiasm for sequencing was growing and criticism of an absolutistic commitment to ICE informed consent was growing, so was despair about the efficacy of informed consent for testing single genes, uh, much less for sequencing entire genomes. So regarding single genes, there's long been all sorts of very reasonable hand-wringing about how patients don't understand the facts, how they 
radically misperceive the power of genomic information. You know, turns out that most people don't remember that they underwent an informed consent process, much less, you know, understand the, their experience in it. Um, which, um, and then there is, of course, even more um, despair about how much use um, informed consent is going to, to uh, be in, in, this, in the context of whole genome sequencing. Um, as Johann Bester, Christy Cole, and Eric Kodish have very importantly observed, the sheer volume of information detected by whole genome sequencing can create what they call emotional overwhelm and informational overload. They say, but given the inherent com complexity, com given the inherently complex informational factors that may overwhelm patient capacity, we argue that informed consent is inherently not possible and that an alternative model be involved, invoked in dealing with clinical genetic sequencing. Uh, the alternative they invoke follow, following uh, Barbara Koenig and others is a community governance model that is in lieu of overwhelming patients, they recommend that patients should consent to be governed by decisions made by their peers, a, a suggestion that I'm going to come back to in my wrap up. So if the negative psychosocial impacts of receiving genetic information are on average mild and transient, and if the enthusiasm is growing, and if informed consent can get in the way of potentially life-saving information, and if despair about the efficacy of informed consent is growing, why not let informed consent go in the genetics context or the genomics context? And so um, now I want to suggest three facts that, in my view, militate against um, what I take to be a, be a premature letting go of uh, informed consent. Um, I, I, I really like this spaghetti plot. Um, so the first point I would like to make is um, uh, one that is not news to anyone in this room, but persons are not averages. Um, this spaghetti plot comes from our Sears work on the psychosocial impacts on parents of receiving genomic information about their child's autism. Um, it's literally uh, a little blurry and and the p-value is indeed 0.19, but I think that it helps to make my incredibly basic point about persons not being averages. The y-axis indicates how optimistic one was on an optimism scale called the life orientation test, and on the x-axis, you see someone's score before receiving a gen genomic test and then approximately a month after receiving it. Each blue line represents the trajectory of an individual from before to after. As you can see, whereas for some people there's a fairly steep increase in optimism correlated with the receipt of the information with other persons, there's a fairly steep decrease. And the red line represents the average change from 21.0 to 20.9. So basically on average, there's no change. But again, my point is simply to emphasize that whenever we talk about average impacts, as quantitative studies do, and as systematic reviews and meta-analyses do, we are bracketing or ignoring the fact that many persons' experiences are not average. So I guess another way of putting that point is to say that the absence of average negative impacts does not mean the absence of negative impacts. Um, indeed, different from the reassuring results that Scott Roberts and Christopher Wade reported in their really terrific systematic studies and meta-analyses, many other researchers have found less um, reassuring results. Tara Lineweaver and colleagues found that knowledge of APOE status can bias how individuals rate their own memory functioning and how they perform on neuropsych tests, that is, informing older adults they have a genotype associated with an increased risk of Alzheimer's can have a negative impact on their subjective perception of their memory abilities and 
um, on their performance on objective memory tests. Um, Maya Sabatello, who is in, 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 my, in, in Ruth Ottman's group, or was at the time, um, has found an association between the belief that epilepsy is genetically caused and the feeling uh, that one has been stigmatized. As Matt Lebowitz says, um, uh, research has shown there's an association between genetic attributions for depression and prognostic pessimism. Um, again, that is that people who attribute their depression to a biochemical or genetic cause tend to predict that their symptoms will last longer than people who attribute their depression to something else like their style of thinking or their day-to-day -day problems. And consistent with Lebowitz's result in our Sears large study, uh, where genomic information about, gen aut about autism was returned to the parents of autistic children, we found a minority of patients who, a minority of parents who, after receiving that information, became more pessimistic um, about their child's future than they were before they had the genomic information. No matter how small the proportion of people who are negatively impacted, it remains the case that there are persons, like real persons, beyond two standard deviations from the mean. And it seems that they deserve as much respect as persons at the mean. Um, and no one has argued more powerfully, I think, than Rachel Grob, again, in that 2019 special issue, but not only there. Um, she has argued for the importance of remembering that intensive qualitative studies of the sort she and others do, do detect sometimes large psychosocial impacts. Whoops. When Grob and Allison Werner Lynn and others do in depth interviews in the prenatal and newborn contexts, they find in some persons impacts that are not mild. Uh, in the newborn context, Grob finds that in a subset of patients, learning about a genetic variant with highly variable penetrance and expressivity can interrupt the bonding process between newborns and new parents. Again, a subset of parents, patients. In the prenatal context, Werner Lynn finds that in the subset of patients, receiving a variant of unknown significance can be associated with considerable stress and anxiety. Although most of the negatively impacted people they interview recover from the stress or anxiety or guilt they experienced upon the receipt of uncertain information, this minority expressed regret about having endured that experience. Now, surely, regret is part of life, as is uncertainty, and most people get over both. But as Werner Lynn puts it, based upon her in-depth interviews, if parents had a better appreciation of what they were in for, that is, if they had a better informed consent process, at least some of them would have declined to enroll in the CMA testing uh, or to consent to learn, to learn the VUS data that they learned in the study they were in. And indeed, Miriam Kupperman's research suggests that people who get an informed consent process in the prenatal context decrease their enthusiasm to get testing, perhaps in part because they come to understand some of the uncertainty and psychosocial difficulty that can attend receiving uncertain information, especially in that context. Furthermore, um, all of the research that shows mild and transient negative impacts on average has included people who went through an informed consent process. And many people, of course, declined to participate in the studies. Those who declined may have had many different reasons from not being interested in research to just being concerned about privacy. But it's not unreasonable to speculate that among those reasons that some declined was that they thought they were at high risk of being negatively impacted by bad genomic news. In the Baby Seek project, about which some of us heard earlier this week, um, which aimed at understanding how interested new parents are at receiving genome sequencing information about their newborns, 92% declined. Now, I, I don't want to exaggerate the importance of that figure. Um, as they point out, um, people are overwhelmed at, at, at the birth of a child and 
study. But 12 of the percent of people who gave a specific reason for declining indicated that they had concerns about the psychosocial impacts. And the earlier MedSeq uh, study had a, found a similar result. So that is, we have reason to believe that the research showing that the impacts are mild and transient on average does not necessarily reflect the the experience of people who deem themselves psychologically vulnerable and who did not participate in the studies. It is possible, um, per the affective forecasting literature, that the people who deemed themselves psychologically vulnerable were wrong about themselves. I grant that that's entirely possible, but even if it were true that most people are more resilient than they know themselves to be, it seems to me it would be an ethical mistake to, to fail to honor a competent person's claim that they're not among the adaptable and resilient. So to wrap up, um, before repeating what, what I've tried to say, allow me to try to clarify what I have not said or done. Um, in calling for holding on to informed consent in some form, I am not trying to put a roadblock in the way of life-saving uh, testing, although I understand that it sometimes sounds that way to some enthusiastic um, geneticists. And I, I just, that's just not fair. That's not what I'm on about. It's not to put a roadblock. Um, in the way of informed consent. It's not to put a, a roadblock in the way of testing. I don't see that as the purpose of informed consent. And I'm not imagining a world in which all patient preferences are uncritically acceded to. As Ben, Berman, as ben Berkman at, and others have observed, allowing patients to harm themselves is a very strange way of showing them respect. Nor Am I imagining a world that protects patients from all regret and uncertainty? I think Ainsley Newson, who, I, who spoke at one of our conferences, is absolutely right to remind us that uncertainty is part of a good life and that uncertainty is and will continue to be inherent to genomic medicine. Nor am I underestimating the huge difficulty in trying to not let informed consent go in a world of genome sequencing. I do think that one key to preserving informed consent in some form may be to create something like the bins of the sort that Jessica Berg and Jim Evans um, described in 2011. Uh, there are variations on their bins or tiers um, in Elin Bunnock's 2013 piece. Their bins sound like a reasonable place to start, and I list the five of them there. The first two are medically actionable results and information that may be sensitive and, and wanted, and they give the example of, a of APOE. Please notice, it seems to me that Bester and Johann Bester and Barbara Koenig and many others are saying something terribly important and helpful when they recommend a model of community governance where we give consent to abide by the decisions of our representatives. There's something important going on here. Um, for example, or that is in the governance approach, community members, scientists, and clinicians deliberate together about which results are worth sharing with patients, where so far what's worth sharing with patients seems to me to have been a discussion about genes that are medically actionable. That is, I believe that thus far, and I'm very eager to, to learn more here, I believe that thus far the community governance efforts have been primarily if not exclusively focused on just one bin, the bin of actionable research, uh, of actionable results, medically actionable results. So it, it seems to me, however, that indiv individual persons are still going to need to be offered some sort of informed consent process decide, to decide which bins they want access to. 
I think we're still going to need to honor the fact that, for example, some perfectly reasonable people want, will want access to the bin that includes the APOE result, which is not medically actionable, and will end others, reasonable people, um, are not. Whereas I am happy to defer to the wisdom of the community on decisions about which go genes go into the bin of actionable ones, I am not prepared to defer to the wisdom of the community on decisions on whether someone will access the bin that includes, for example, the APOE result. So my very humble uh, bottom line, it's true that on average, among people who've gone through an informed consent process to receive genomic information, the negative psychosocial impacts have been mild and transient. As I've emphasized, that generalization is based on the experiences of people who went through an informed consent process to receive that information. At this point, we just don't know how many of them declined because based on their understanding of their own psychological and or social vulnerability, they were at risk of being negatively impacted. Even if it's true that most persons who receive such information don't experience large and enduring negative impacts, it is important to recognize that some persons beyond two standard deviations from the mean do experience negative impacts. Given the fact of individual psychological differences, it seems to me it would be highly surprising if there were otherwise. As the authors of the Belmont report intimated, the informed consent process will never work as well as we would wish. God knows it has to be rethought in the context of genomics, given the sheer volume of information at issue. But the alternative to holding on to informed consent is to fail to show all persons the respect they deserve. All right. And most importantly, or oops, I want to thank um, Ashna Lal, who's the senior project manager and research assistant at the Hastings Center, um, who has been my collaborator in thinking about this paper and in gathering the resources. So thank you to Ashna and thank you to Paul and Ruth and the grant for um, all the time that we've spent together. All right, over to questions. Ruth, back to you. Thank you so much, Eric. And, you know, may our collaborations continue. Yeah, amen. Um, so Tanya has her hand up, I think, or was that a mistake? No. Okay. I, I was really... clapping. <laughs> oh, you were clapping. Okay. We can all clap. That's good. Um, there are a few comments in the chat here. Um, Rose Marie Thompson is referring to the work of, I think, Nancy Wexler, but you might, maybe her sister also contributed on Huntington's disease. Um, and Anna Lewis, oh, Anna, did you want to make your point? Wait, Rosemary, is are you gonna? I, I didn't get what Rosemary's question was. I'm not looking at the chat. May I? Could you? Could people speak up, or would you please repeat the question? Yeah, uh, is Rosemary here? I'll bet she is. There she is. Hi. You can uh, show yourself and unmute. Well, I'm not in a position to show okay. myself, but no I'm problem. happy to unmute. Okay. Um, what I was referring to is Alice Wexler, Nancy Wexler's sister, oh, okay. book mm -hmm. called Mapping Fate, which uh, showed us that um, after the test for the gene for Huntington's was developed, much to everyone's surprise, not very many people, only about 25% of people who uh, mm -hmm. would have a reason to suspect Huntington's in their uh, genetic families had the test. And yeah. this required a lot of explanation. And this happened quite a long time ago uh, because it was an early test. Um, I wonder if you wanna reflect on the psychology of that. I mean, you already have Eric in the sense that 
um, having Huntington's is not necessarily a uh, actionable item. Um, so just, it was an interesting example to bring forward. Oh, it, it's a really helpful one. Thank you so much, Rosemary, for bringing that up. Yeah, my recollection is that um, 20% of, maybe it's, who knows, 20 or 25% of the people um, who were eligible chose to get testing after an informed consent process. And what what I find, what I found interesting about that work was that the people who chose to get the testing, regardless of whether they tested positive or not, turned out to do just fine. But, but your point is, and the point I was trying to get is that 80% of the people or 75% of the people identified themselves as th th they thought that it wouldn't <laughs> be fine for them or they didn't want it. Those are important to distinguish, I guess. But anyway, you're, ma you're making my point, Rosemary, and I appreciate it without an informed consent process. Um, well, to put it positively, it seems to me that people need an informed consent process so that they can make that choice. I, you know, we, I've observed the same thing in my epilepsy studies. We offered people, well, we asked people whether they would want testing if it were offered. And hugely, you know, almost everyone said yes, you know, 85% or something. And then we offered a subset of those people testing and a very small minority actually went through the testing. And it's, it was not a devastating illness like Huntington's disease, but um, so so it's it's a really good point. I think it's been observed in in many contexts. If I might, Ruth, make one point. I really admire what Ingrid Holm and the folks at Harvard are doing because they're really trying to tease apart why it is that the people who don't get testing yeah. don't get testing. Yeah. And I, I don't want to make the mistake, and as I just did a minute ago, <laughs> of assuming that, you know, lots of people are confident that there would be um, negative psychosocial impacts for them. I, that, we just don't have evidence that that's true. It's but, very, I, it's, very difficult to figure out why. I mean, I, 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 I don't know the answer to that either. It's a great, re no, but I'm saying it's a great research question. And, yeah. yeah. And, but the problem is that people who don't want to participate don't want to participate in telling you why they don't want to participate. You know, it's very difficult to obtain that information. Well, that's what they've been working on trying to do, as I yeah. understand, maybe. So it, it's hard. I'm sure it is hard, but it, it's really interesting. I think it's important to try to do. Yeah. Uh, Todd, did you want to say something? Yes. Uh, my question, thank you, by the way, great presentation. I, my question is for, for Eric, but also for anybody else uh, on the panel. If any, if any of you have thoughts on how these uh, studies might relate to um, pre-implantation genetic testing, uh, particularly polygenic uh, PGT. Mm. Would you please say more, uh, Todd, about your, yeah, would you just spell out your question? Sure, so I, I guess, um, you know, I've been studying uh, pre-implantation genetic uh, polygenic testing for a couple of years now. And uh, one thing we, we think about and we're developing some surveys for is, you know, what people's attitudes, reactions uh, will be upon receiving this kind of testing, uh, how that could negatively or positively impact them, um, and how one could properly be informed about any potential um, risks of, of that kind of information. Uh, when the information itself is uh, probabilistic and and challenging to even quantify. So pre-implantation genetic testing using polygenic risk scores. Correct. Yeah. Does anybody else, I'm, I'm happy to take a, a, a go at that, but did anybody else on the panel want to respond first? I, I can't see everybody, so people should just jump in as they'd like. Okay. Um, I don't so, know that so, I have a very profound thought uh, I think it's a very interesting question, Todd. Uh, I mean, I, it occurs to me that in a sense, pre-implantation testing is always actionable, right? I mean, that's why people do it. Um, so in a sense, it's, 
it it doesn't seem to me like it has the same kind of I, I don't know, maybe it, 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 it strikes me just speculatively that maybe it doesn't have the same risk of um, leading to a, a loss of a feeling of agency or prognostic pessimism that um, we sometimes worry about because I, of the context I, in which it's done and the reason for which it's done, unless I'm misunderstanding. Well, the, the issue that I see with this has to do with the polygenic risk scores not having the level of predictive value that right. that you know some of the things that are used for prenatal diagnosis have right i guess the thing you'd want to be careful about there is making sure that people are understanding the information in yeah. a in an accurate way whatever that whatever we're deciding that means in this context yeah very um, challenging yeah well, I would just acknowledge that I haven't thought about the question, and it is an interesting question. The The only thought that occurs to my mind is that this is a very unique group of people with the resources to, um, you know, get polygenic scores for their embryos. So, um, you know, if I had to guess what the psychosocial impacts would be, I would guess that they're going to be, you know, uh, modest and transient, if any. Um, but that's, you know, I'd like to think about the question more. It's an interesting question. Todd, could you share a little bit more about, about the study design that you're using? Um, well, our study design is, is really just, uh, well, we started with an interview. Uh, we've been interviewing uh, parents undergoing IVF, not obviously uh, receiving uh, uh, polygenic screening, but just about what they would think about it, whether they would be oh. interested in it, what okay. they see as the yeah. pros and cons. Right. And we're going to be rolling out a larger scale survey. Uh -huh. uh, again, in the broad population of parents undergoing IVF. I see. Um, yeah. uh, I know the company Genomic Prediction that offers the polygenic screening is doing their own study of people actually receiving polygenic screening. Mm. Uh, but, you know, they're, you know, there's an intrinsic conflict in, in yeah. uh, or at least a confound. I, it's it's a very important question to look at. I, for one, before we go into another question, I, I would, you know, I, I'm sure you would too, Todd, love to follow those embryos as they become people and see um, to what extent parents are delighted by or um, disappointed by um, the extent to which their child lives lives up to the prediction made about them. Mm -hmm. um, but I... I <laughs> <laughs> that, that how the prediction maybe influences their parenting. Yeah, yeah. Probably. well, we just actually, we just, um, uh, my colleague uh, Remy Fur was the first author on a little commentary we just uh, had, I don't know if it's out online yet, in a job, uh, on exactly that. Um, we, we actually call that phenomenon nurture genetics. He's a social psychologist and sort of behavioral economist type, um, and exactly, without having direct data on this scenario, but bringing in studies from related and adjacent fields, uh, the idea of a self-fulfilling prophecy uh, is one that we did raise there. So Matt, I think that's a great a great point. Um, and this may is I Rose say, Maria. great background for your Zoom. I, I just have been admiring it. This is Rose Marie. I wanted to crash in again. Um, I don't type, so talking is very helpful. Um, I wanted to point out that um, Rob Sparrow has done some interesting work on just this, as has Michael Sandel, to think about, and there's a lot of other work too, to think about the consequences of uh, children that disappoint their parents' expectations for what they had intended uh, in terms of making some kinds of uh, genetic or prenatal interventions in this respect. Hmm. Uh, Lisa Dive has done some of this as well. Very interesting. Anna, did you want to make your comment now? Yeah, thanks. Hi. Just to say that I think that the implementation, basically, of the model that you described, Eric, whereby um, sort of communities define what goes in the bins and individuals select whether they want to know about a given bin, is actually fairly mainstream. It's like the 
the model by which you have, can add opt-ins or opt-outs as part of informed consent. So for example, we heard about one of those uh, on Monday at the seminar in the Garden Study based at Columbia. Um, but I just want to flag that there are known problems with that model, the implementation of that model, um, which are associated with the other problems of informed consent that you mentioned. But like people, there are, you know, there's empirical data that suggests people often don't remember the decisions that they've made or think that they, you know, yeah. that they would have made the different decision um, if prompted to again. So um, yeah, I would say it's 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 already fairly mainstream, um, but it's challenging to get it right. Well, I, I, oh, I'm really glad you said that, Anna, because I didn't for a moment mean to suggest that I was saying anything novel. I was, um, I was, I'm, I, the whole talk was really an attempt to push back against what I take to be a push in some quarters to let informed consent go. So first of all, I didn't mean it to, to sound novel. To, to, I didn't mean to suggest, I thought there was anything novel. Moreover, I I, I tried to say explicitly that there are huge challenges, and right. I, I'm the last person on earth to uh, profess to you know know the solutions to those. Yeah, and just another thing, I think uh, the people who advocate to drop informed consent, um, they usually raise uh, equity arguments, which I didn't. I might have missed it, but like I think that is an interesting point that needs to be engaged with. Okay, Josie, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask if when you were looking at this stuff, Eric, you saw anything about um, how people feel about um, not being asked. So I um, fully understand that people, um, uh, you know, mostly agree if they are asked, if they want to have testing. I mean, I know there are exceptions to that, um, but do people care about being asked, even if what they do is the very predictable thing of saying yes to something? So I'm asking this because it feels to me like um, I've sort of seen people be very aghast at the idea that something would be done without their informed consent, even as you, even if it would save their life. Um, so that like people have a you know have, have a right to be asked. They expect to be asked, even if what they do is the predictable thing of like what medical advice suggests they should do and say yes, that they would be quite aghast just at not being asked. Is there any data on that? Because, um, you know, even for things that you were saying, like, well, you would want people to get, I think you quoted um, Ben Burton, we shouldn't let people say no to life-saving uh, information. But actually people routinely say no to life-saving, you know, people do get to say no to life-saving things in medicine um so I just wanted to know if you is there data showing like regardless of what choice you make and what impact it has on you the having of the choice do people value that well I I don't have a good answer to that um because I know I don't know the answer the simple answer is no I don't know the data I was a, I wouldn't be shocked if it were nation specific I, in in the states probably people would be aghast at not being asked um, yeah, I don't think that Ben's point was, Ben Berkman's point is to um, shove life-saving treatments down people's throats. I think it's um, an attempt to help us see the limits of respecting autonomy in this context. There, it, there's just something um, incoherent about um, saying that a physician is going to respect somebody's autonomy um, at the cost of uh, failing to um, offer them a benefit that they take to be important. It, it, my point is that it, he's not as absolute. I, 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 I hope I didn't make it sound like. Um, well, I hope I didn't make it sound absolutistic. There's nothing absolutistic about his argument. He's trying to point out um how it's possible to take exceeding to patient requests too far um i i just want to read one more of the comments in the chat and then i think we should move to our to our wind up um and this is bob resta saying 
he's taking care of his six month old granddaughter and he can't ask his question live because she will demand his attention if he does. He says, don't people have the right to make what appears to us to be perfectly ridiculous decisions about their lives and health care? What appears to us to be bad decisions, in fact, can turn out to be perfectly appropriate given their unique social and psychological context. As Bonnie Beatty pointed out vis-a-vis -vis HD, um, while certain tests may have profound impact on a person's health, sometimes people are not in a place to hear that information and people's decisions may change over time. Uh, so he says one of his mantras is, nobody has genetic testing until they're ready to, ready to have genetic testing. So thank you, Bob. And by the way, I've never met you in person. I always see you on these events. So it's nice to meet uh, this way, at least. Um, you're, you're forcing me, and Josie's question did too, um, you're, you're helping to remind me that Ben Berkman was talking about secondary findings, right? Um, that is, someone has already given consent to receive a primary finding. Um, it does not seem un wholly unreasonable to me that if they um, have given consent to receive one life-saving finding, they would not object to uh, receiving another. Um, and that's why the, the opt-out situation that ACMG ultimately adopted um, makes sense to me. Um, so what I'm trying to do, what I was trying to do in the talk is figure out how you can find a middle way between overdoing um, autonomy and overdoing beneficence, um, to put it really crudely. Um, I wanna figure out a way to respect persons that really respects persons. And the limit for me might be, you're no longer respecting someone if you don't push hard for them to get a life-saving intervention. And I think it would be irrational. I mean, well, it just doesn't, I don't know how that would happen in the context of the secondary finding. Um, right, I mean, you've already said, I want the primary finding. I want the, the targeted gene. Um, so there doesn't seem to be a great danger to me of violating someone's um, personhood or their autonomy in that context. But maybe I'm making my life too easy. I'm sorry you can't speak. I guess I should, I don't know if I should thank your granddaughter or not. <laughs> okay. Vardit, I see you have just revealed yourself. Welcome. Thank you, and my apologies that I couldn't join earlier, but I wanted okay. to catch at least the tail end. Okay, terrific. So we're up to the point where we will ask Josie to give us a summary. Very big challenge, Josie. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Ruth. Um, so first of all, thank you to Ruth for putting... Um, I know that there was a team behind this um, was, conference, but a, as a the face of... Paul of... Applebaum, Eric Perrins... Um, Katie Tab, Matt App, uh, Matt Lebowitz, and did I say Paul Applebaum? I think yeah, I said. Yeah, but you twice. can say him twice. That might okay. be appropriate. But I just wanted to thank you. And Ruth. Abby Fire. I'm sorry, Abby, Abby Fire as well. Thanks for being the face of the um, afternoon <laughs> in um, Eastern Standard Time, and um, for to the whole team for putting together the discussion. It's um, it it does feel to me um, like a very sophisticated place to be at in the in the life of the seer and um of the center at columbia and in, in our discussions about you know as a huge community of lc scholars and discussions about genetics um because it's taking a lot of um you know complexity seriously not just in the genetics but also in people's reactions to um different kinds of results different kinds of explanations that are offered and um then therefore like ending up where you are with Eric having very I think complicated in a good way nuanced things to say about what that might mean for medical practice or for research studies with humans so it seems like a really mature and 
I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to be patronizing. I just mean like Eric sort of, you know, talked about how people we once thought things might be in terms of the impacts of, of genetics. And here we are having this really quite complex discussion about what we really are seeing. Um, so I'm going to switch to to trying to speak a little bit more just for myself because um, obviously everybody would have a different experience of this really rich this, um, set of presentations and discussions. But what I took from it was, um, and we started out by looking at, at um, how, how we react to causal explanations, what, we, um, what features of causal explanations we um, you know, we humans, I suppose, um, or what does this research show that that are um, uh, things we sort of prefer or lean on, um, and what that, and then therefore what that tells. That was so. I'm thinking here about Tanya and um, uh, Kate, uh, Kate, Katie, or Kate's um, uh, discuss, uh presentations. Um, but then also sort of, and then as Matt was sort of showing where that takes us in terms of um, the kind of getting us towards the kind of normative um, salute, uh, conclusions we might come to. Um, and what that took me back to was just feeling that um, that it, it kind of makes you think, well, are we able to give very informed consent? Are we able to give have very informed reactions to results and to ex um, causal explanations if we are making what, some might call errors in our um, understanding of them, or if we have biases in terms of the kind of paths we like to go down, or we don't want to hear complicated explanations, we like explanations that are reductive, we like um, to uh, uh, look at um, sort of stable features, um, and we see genes as those, therefore it's that kind of deterministic thinking is still going on. That makes me wonder then, are we able to give the kind of informed consent that Eric was, you know, really rightly pointing out that we, I think, still need to um, aspire to in many situations and maybe we just do it in a slightly different way than we we used to, but we still hold informed consent dear. Um, so those kind of errors or patterns in our thinking around cause um, seem like they really should create some uh, you know, hard questions for us about about informed consent processes, and um, where I've kind of stuck right now in my kind of thinking about and reaction to the presentations this morning is um, how do we better help people understand what they're agreeing to based on what we've learned about how people think about causes and about genetic causes in particular? What do we take from the research that um, Tanya and Kate and Matt presented about various different aspects of our way of thinking about cause? What do we tell? How do we incorporate that into informed consent processes, or maybe um, something that should perhaps precede that, which is just more um, public understanding of genetics? And I know this is sort of like churning an old handle or something but um uh it seems to me that we get a good amount of data showing that the lay public and even that people who encounter genetic testing um often come in with a pretty outdated understanding of what genetics is and what genetics can tell us um it's it's simplistic and not a lot has been done to challenge that or to improve it or enrich it, um, more positively said. And so um, uh, until we've done some of that work to help people come into this testing with a richer understanding of what it might mean to get genetic testing or to receive results or to be on one of, I'm, I'm you would imagine one of the panels that Eric was referring to, one of the community panels that could make decisions, you know, they would probably have to be educated in this way. Um, until we've done that, it's very hard to know what to make, I think, of things like the baby sex study showing that most people weren't actually interested in testing when it was offered to them in real life, or what you were finding, um, Ruth, about people refusing testing when it was actually offered. So, um, or even on honestly of the prior studies where people were hypothetically offered it and they said, yeah, I'd love to have that. 
and were really enthusiastic and then when they got offered it they didn't want it like What's I'd love to know now? what what in there how much of that is to do with some of the things that we heard about earlier in this day around what we think about cause and some of the valences that we have on it and some of our I think honestly misunderstandings about what genetic findings tell us so that's I think where I keep going back to is just that um the how do we bring the findings that we've been discussing today into not just into clinical medicine but into public understanding and that seems like a massive challenge that um that LC researchers have some direct responsibility for trying to address. Um, so it's I think it's that it's might it's be it's enough yeah. of oh, my reflection. Fabulous, story. Josie. You're so good at this. <laughs> um, but I would love to hear any other reactions like that. I mean, we, it's very hard for me not to kind of go like, okay, now what? Now what are we going to do yeah. to help try to address some of what I take to be problems that people have been showing? But it us. does it um, does highlight the depth of the challenge in helping people to understand the massive flood of genetic information and emphasis and genomic and emphasis on genetic causes. Uh, it does, that, but that I is, do also that is, that is happening, and it's increasing. It's a flood, you know. It's we're being inundated with it, or the public is being inundated with it. I think, and there might be um, other things that people are encountering that have a similar structure. So I don't know whether public engagement with climate change science and that that if that is a model, like if that has some of the same outlines of like a a complete or not or whether public engagement with okay. um, sort of the use of, of cell phones and technology and screen time, whether that kind of, um, that AI. maybe has some of the same out, outlines of like, this is complicated, some of this is good, some of it's not good, there's different things feeding into whether or not it's good in the moment. Like, are we developing, are there other um, technologies that we're engaging with or um, scientific kind of realms that people are ordinary people are engaging with a little bit more yeah. that are also complex and have complicated causal stories happening in them and are there things going on there that can help us yeah. with this particular version of that same sort of set of questions others want to jump in oh i see that um lawrence asked a question about the role of national healthcare systems in vetting what types of testing are made available. The US system of you get what you want is not the best way to bring. Yeah, so obvious, definitely other healthcare systems, including the one I'm currently a beneficiary of, um, make decisions about what's available. Um, but there's lots of pushback as well. So there's, even though I don't get to choose whether or not I can have this or that genetic test, directly there's public and media engagement with and debate about and pushback on the decisions that are made by the gatekeeper by the government gatekeeping agency so those same for better and maybe sometimes for worse um so same kinds of questions come up but at a collective level but they're not all behind closed doors like I think some of that is a public discussion too And people who are denied are often, you know, profiled in the media. People who are denied care or denied different treatments because they're not, or interventions because they're not part of the, the package. So it might be more rational and satisfying to scientists and researchers, but it can still be, um, there's still pressure points around, you know, very sort of highly sympathetic individuals who are good at advocating for themselves. So Ruth, do you want um in this next part, would you like, how would you like to well just I, have people um I offer think their thoughts? Or? What we could do is ask people to uh turn on their videos and and invite them to make comments on anything that happened today. Paul, you have your hand raised, I see. Yeah. So um heard Josie's challenge. 
um, to find ways to improve understanding of genetic information. Um, I'm wondering if any of the panelists have thoughts about the value of not just teaching the realities of genetics, which is what was suggested um, before, and Kate put a, a reference to that in the chat, but teaching ab about the kinds of mistakes that people make and the sort of general themes that go along with them, simplicity, stability, et cetera. Is, is there, um, do you have thoughts about whether that in itself would be valuable? And then of course, the ultimate question is, do we have any evidence uh, so far that, that that in fact is true? I, I can um, say something. Oh, Kate, go ahead. It looks like you unmuted. Oh, I just wanted to clarify, would you, do you mean teaching um, patients who are potentially receiving this information or teaching people within medical practice? So that they're aware of the biases when they communicate the information. Well, so I was thinking of patients, but um, I think you're making a good point in your question, which is they are not the only ones who are subject to misunderstanding um, health. We, we've got lots of data that suggests that health professionals as a group don't do a don't do very well in terms of their knowledge of uh, of genetics um, either. Um, but I guess I was focused on, on the people who are getting this information back. Yeah. I'll, I'll let Tanya weigh in. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Matt. You probably know more. I, I can comment on the general education problem here, but I don't know much about this very specific context. So Matt might know more about that. Um, I, I don't have much to say about it. I, we, I was just going to say that we do, we did do a number of years ago. Um, we did do a, few studies where we looked at giving people very brief educational interventions that were that were aimed at this the sort of dispelling misconceptions about genetic or bio, biological explanations implying um, immutability and fixedness and so sort of targeting the essentialism as it's referred to in psychology um, directly and and um, sort of doing drawing on some some educational intervention sort of work existing in psychology that suggests that if you, that sort of like what you said, that um, making explicit the process, the, the fact that um, you might be making this mistake, so here's what you might want to think about instead. Um, and we found some evidence that these, uh, these kinds of strategies could be helpful in reducing um, genetic essentialism and sort of the neuroessentialism, which is kind of the brain um, equivalent. But I think you're, there's still this issue that the underlying scientific concepts are very complicated and difficult for, to teach people, um, especially in a five minute video or something that like what we were trying to use in the studies. And, um, you know, I think if uh, a psychiatric geneticist or watched the videos we use, they might not think that you know, even though we thought we were helping improve levels of sophistication, you know, some others might disagree. Part of that might be because these were made 10 years ago, but it may also just be because it's really hard to convey this information in a sophisticated way and in a, but that's also digestible and um, that people are going to have the attention span for. So I think it is a very, uh, a very tricky problem, but, um, but yeah, I'm interested to hear what Tanya has to say. Yeah, I was going to insert two notes of pessimism, unfortunately, um, and this comes from thinking about other domains where there have been efforts to improve people's scientific understanding. Um, so, so one thing is, if we're thinking about interventions, I think thinking about this more broadly than just the patient in a clinical context receiving a result would be valuable. I mean, do we, do we need to think about this more at the K-12 education level and beyond? Because part of the problem is what people are seeing in, in the media and in the way that these ideas are discussed more generally, right? So the culture is going to be reinforcing um, various misconceptions, I think in a problematic way. Um, the pessimism is that most efforts that I know of to try to teach someone a critical thinking tool, like how to perform a particular statistical evaluation or how to avoid a particular cognitive bias, um, 
overwhelmingly those interventions are not effective. And the sense in which they're not effective is that you don't see a lot of transfer beyond the specific context in which you um, introduce them. And so you can, you know, you can in the context of like a, a particular class or a particular situation, maybe get people to learn how to use this tool reliably, but then they go into the real world and they tend to not take that with them. Um, and so that strikes me as a challenge for this case too, especially for more general lessons that we might want to teach people, like be wary of favoring simple explanations or, you know, keep in mind that not all relationships are stable or, um, you know, not everything has a function and a purpose or, you know, don't commit versions of the naturalistic fallacy. So I, I'm skeptical of the general version of that being very effective. Although of course I'd love to, I would love to be wrong about this. So if anybody here has ideas for how to teach this in a generalizable way, that would be fantastic. Um, but I guess, I suppose, because I think the problem is largely generalization, I'm a little bit more optimistic about what you could do in the context of a specific case where it's one person faced with one particular genetic result that has one potential set of implications for them. Maybe in the context of that case, if the if what does and doesn't follow is made extremely clear, that might be beneficial. But then expecting that to generalize to some other cases is, is where the I think more of the skepticism comes in, or or maybe not skepticism, pessimism about being able to have really robust interventions. And for for that kind of intervention to work, it would require a system in which we teach the teachers. You know, we teach the physicians who are going to be communicating that information which is a challenge in itself. But I guess you could work on, you know, medical school curricula and, and so forth. Well, I mean, that's what genetic counselors in theory are trained to do, um, yeah. provide that kind of information in an in individualized way. Yeah. Of course, there's a, often, there's a lot of concern about the genetic counseling workforce not being yeah. Mm -hmm. large enough to for the right and not everyone goes to a genetic counselor right. or not everyone right. has access yeah. to that do genetic counselors explicitly um you re reference these kinds of um kind of critical thinking challenges when they're do you know when they're delivering news like might they say something like not just deliver the comp the true complicated story but also say things like many patients you know, leap from A to B. I just want you to think uh -huh. about that. When we, you know, did they actually explicit ever? Do we know? <laughs> I don't think that's part of their curriculum. Well, if their genetic counselor is still with us, we should ask them. Oh yes, we must have some genetic counselors with us. Going once. I think maybe Bonnie. Bonnie is Batty that is is a genetic counselor. Um. This is Rosemarie again. I'm not a genetic counselor, but I do know a lot of, I've been participating in a lot of uh, work that genetic counselors are doing about introducing these questions. And yes, they do. Uh, some genetic counseling training programs are involved in asking some of these kinds of complicated questions about information and what kinds of information people want to know, but not all genetic counseling. But there's quite a conversation about this. Call for genetic counselors, otherwise I There's the baby. I might be able to answer, or as a retired genetic counselor. <laughs> Um, this is Rosemarie again. I had my hand up. Can I ask one I'm more sorry, question? I'm sorry. Yes, I noticed that. Sorry. Hear me? Um, Can I be heard? Or, or should we yes. have Bob first? I don't know what the cue is. Well, yeah, I think your hand was raised first. Bob may have a limit on the time when he exactly. So, why don't you? Can I be heard? Comment? Yes. Please. Yes. So my my question is. I just, I didn't hear the question. I heard a call for a genetic counselor. So my reflex kicked in. And uh, so what was the question for genetic counselor? Well, the question I think is how much training and sensitivity do genetic counselors have today in the kinds of challenges for communicating this sort of informa causal information that we've been talking well. about? Yeah, I, I mean, that was what I did for 37 years, I like to think. I mean, sometimes more successfully than others. Uh -huh. uh, and I think that's the goal of all JETA counselors is to try and be as sensitive to all that as possible. We're often not successful. And one of the things I learned is 
what you say to them is not what they hear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you ever explicitly reference the kinds of cognitive like slippages that, or the kind of reasoning slippages that we've, some of the ones that we've been talking about today? So I think what I would do is I would try and figure out what a patient's personal goals were. And if their decision was not consistent with their personal goals, then I would delve into that more. So if they said, well, I don't want to get breast cancer, but then they say, well, I don't want to do BRCA testing. I'd say, well, I can understand why you don't want BRCA testing, but how do you think that jives with your, with your feelings about not having testing? I think it requires a really a lot of in-depth conversation and some counseling skills. Yeah. Rose I see Bonnie. Bonnie's probably, yes, no. I think I have to go at the moment, sorry. Okay, thank you very much, Bob. We understand. I, I, Rosemary, did you want to finish your comment? Yes, thank you very much. This has been a really terrific uh, conference. Thank you very much to the organizers and the presenters. Um, I had a thought uh, about the question of people who make decisions or hold opinions that we take to be counterintuitive uh, or perplexing. And I wanted to offer um, a literature, if you will, that is sometimes called the disability paradox. It has other names as well. And these are studies uh, where people uh, with pretty significant disabilities like quadriplegia or even paraplegia or other kinds of disabilities, um, come forward and say that if they were offered a, a cure for this particular disability, they would not particularly be interested in taking it. And this seems very counterintuitive to the we that we generally imagine in the world. Um, and also this is explained with um, a lot of studies that would suggest that sometimes people who have uh, what non-disabled people would consider to be very catastrophic or significant disabilities, again, like becoming quadriplegic, within a year, uh, they tend to return to, their, to the worldview uh, and the temperament that they had before this catastrophic disability descended upon them. And I think that there is some, uh, evidence there in these stories, these attitudes that um, might be helpful for uh, many of us in trying to think through, again, what we think of as counterintuitive responses to information, uh, especially information about genetics or about our biological selves. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's helpful information. And it also reflects a bit on what we think of when we who we're imagining when we talk about we which of course was one of the questions in relation to what happens if we think about the person as being Tanisha or something instead of yeah. Jane mm -hmm. um, so that's uh, probably important to uh, information for us to consider yeah Bonnie so I am also a genetic counselor, retired. Um, so I've been in practice for 40 years or so. And to me, it's a counseling issue. I also saw, uh, taught psychosocial genetic counseling classes. And I think some of these issues about heuristics and then some of the things you're talking about today, um, which seems somewhat similar, just, just counterintuitive ways of think of how we approach life or think about life. And sometimes um, having several things going on at once with a patient. So a patient might be um, seemingly making a decision that's against their best interests because there's really two different things going on in their minds. They say one avo avoided disability, but they their whole identity is caught up with that. Those kinds of conversations, uh, I think we should be teaching genetic counselors how to how to have those conversations with patients. We are teaching that. Um, but there's there's the issue of how we teach, say counselors or other people who are going to talk to patients or the general public. 
and and then how we actually teach it to yeah. once we are those professionals. So um, it just to me, it's a counseling issue, and we sh- we do and should be able to do those tasks of uh, discussion with our patients. Um, oh, Kate. Hi, I have a question for you, Bonnie, um, just because I, it was actually something Bob raised talking about um, his work as a genetic counsellor, that communicating the information accuracy seemed to get through to some patients and not to others. And if you had that experience as well, I was wondering if you had any clues about what those modifying factors might be. Why does, why are some people able to maybe understand the complexities of genetic causation um, and not, not be so deterministic compared to other kinds of patients who, you know, as much as you try to tell them uh, all the complications will, will go down a more um, biased or deterministic route? Um, I'm going to challenge you here and say that's not the right question um, to say, you know, why it's like we've preset our uh, what we think patients should do or should hear or should want to know. Um, patients hear and want to know very different things. So it kind of goes back to what Bob was saying about what are you, what are the person's goals for being there? And are they um, acting in a way that's consonant with that? And can you, as a counselor, help them to have some insight into um, how they're adapting to whatever's in front of them? So I, I guess it it doesn't bother me if somebody has a seemingly um, inconsistent way of looking at things, or they they seem to be having one goal but they're acting in another way, or they're not getting information that I think maybe they should have. Um, sometimes the thing to do is to back up um, and really use an empathic process to try to understand why they're there, you know, what's going on, are there barriers to to them getting what they need to to get to make a decision or to adjust to something in their lives. So I, I don't know if that made any sense. Like I guess yeah, cool. that would yeah. just frame the question a little differently. Mm-hmm. So Bonnie, does that mean that in some ways when you're trying to understand how someone can have one set of goals but be doing a thing that you find that you initially seems to you to be in conflict with those goals, it's a process of you understanding, you coming to understand as much as it might or or more than it might be a process of them coming to like changing or reckon, you know, reconciling the two. Like you're trying to you just you you're learning. Yeah, I mean, or at least that's the attitude you take to it. I think that's that's right. There's my curiosity about that person and my their perception of of trust, and that I'm there in a role not to thwart them in what they say they want to do, but to understand where they where they're coming from. A lot of times, those discussions, um, the most resistant patients, if you approach things the right way, the resistance can melt away as they, it it may be a trust issue. It may be, um, I I, I keep going back to that trust because um, if you're pointing out something that's discrepant, they have to trust and and you're seeing that. And, And sometimes you can just ask the right questions. Like I'm seeing this, can, can you just tell me what that means for you or how ask questions like I just gave you a lot of information what's the most important thing that you see right here mm-hmm. um it, they're kind of counseling tricks that that I think um can can get around some resistant what I would see as resistance in clients um just in order to help them reach their goals I don't know that I really answered your question. <laughs> I mean, we 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 clearly we still have a systems problem, as I said before, because we need so many more genetic counselors, and and the the information that they are challenged to provide is getting more complicated as time moves on with polygenic risk scores and whatnot. 
But maybe we should talk about genetic counseling rather than genetic counselors because mm, yes, well, gen- yeah, I mean, exactly. other people might be doing it, but they're yes, of course, it. yeah. Uh, well, we have reached the end of our conference, and I am so glad that we had this opportunity to come together and and talk about these issues, and I'm so grateful to our fabulous panel of speakers. I mean, really, this has been fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Sad to say that it's the last one of these conferences we'll be having, but um, I think it was a great way to round out our experience. And, And thank you, Paul. And thanks to all of you. Well, thank you, Ruth, for taking the lead and putting this together. And to our speakers, who I agree were just fantastic from start to finish. So it was a it was a great, great way to end. Yeah. And we'll be posting uh, the the video on our on our website, which I assume still exists. <laughs> thank you, Ruth. Will for a while. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.